As well as the general photorealistic beauty, the fauna and flora created for the world of Avatar was and is some of the most praised aspects of the films so far. The native Na'vi live in synergy with the numerous charismatic species on both the land and seas of Pandora, so let's take a deeper, speculative look at the wildlife of Avatar. One of the first creatures encountered by Jake Sully in his first night alone in the Pandoran forests were the Viper Wolves. Known locally as Nantang, they're small, social predators most analogous to Terran canids and spotted hyenas, and every bit as bold. Despite the obvious danger Na'vi presented, Viper Wolves were still willing to go for a lone individual lost at night upon finding Jake, and with numbers and the right opportunity, were willing to take on any beast of the forest. One record states a territorial battle between two great Leonopteryx ended when the two crashed to the forest floor wounded, and both fell prey to a pack of Viper Wolves. The breadth of prey viper wolves will take is facilitated by their generalist design, with jaws capable of consuming bone, eyes with equal day and night vision, and primate-like hands allowing them to successfully climb after more mobile prey, the Pandoran forests are effectively their oyster, with only volant animals being able to escape their 24-hour multi-terrain pack hunts. But viper wolves aren't all danger with their packs being held together by strong social bonds. Viper wolf mothers dote on their playful pups, whom they care for diligently until maturity, with other pack members also hanging back to guard and tend to the den mother whilst the rest of the pack hunt. Like many carnivores, viper wolf young grow quickly, and can run with the pack after a few months, being half adult size at half a year old. This tenderness isn't extended to other social groups though, Viper wolves are fiercely territorial, and their extensive array of unique calls are likely unique to each pack, and serve as key auditory markers to differentiate friend from foe. Social earth predators will have calls that can be unique to certain geographic locations, and can likely detect one another as individuals with their distinct calls. Viper wolves will also vocalise when hunting to coordinate their movements and some earth predators will do the same, with Asian canids known as dolls often being called the whistling hunters, for their distinctive calls made on the trot that are unique to each individual doll. This helps them stay in contact in the thick jungles, and with their similar boldness, agility and social bonds in their jungle home, Viper wolves are perhaps most analogous to them of the earth roster of social predators. Just as viper wolves are the dolls of Pandora, so too is the Thanator the tiger of Pandora's forests. And whereas many predator guilds tend to have more members with more staggered body masses, it seems the incredible versatility of the viper wolves and their ability to take near anything in their packs has left comparatively little room for further niches, with the exception of their huge and distant relative the Thanator. The two terrestrial predators seem the most common and significant predators, and their dexterous hexapod forms with keen senses are clearly a winning design in the Pandoran forests. A separate lineage of predators also exist, albeit in lesser numbers and being seen far less frequently. The slinth is a leopard-like predator using a powerful neurotoxin to stun their prey before eating at leisure. An armoured frill covers the face to protect the slinth's precious fangs, that also doubles as a threat display like a frilled lizard. Whilst successful hunters, a slinth's incredible speed and habit of resting in the Pandoran canopy away from Thanators and Viper Wolves, show as an adaptation to avoid their co-predators and eke out a living tiptoeing around them. The larger and more bizarre Slinger is perhaps the weirdest Pandoran predator. On sensing prey, it fires off its own head like a dart to penetrate the target, then rejoins to the body via the Kuru. This is actually the parent and offspring, Once large enough, the head will grow into an adult form and mate, to have its own detachable head offspring and repeat the process. Once the young have matured, the adult body then dies, having successfully sired the next generation. If the Thanator is the top predator of Pandora's ground floor, then the Great Leonopteryx is the top predator of the skies. Both are feared by the Na'vi, albeit in different ways. Like many large carnivores, their titles don't refer to them as given names, 
but rather descriptions of what they are or the emotions that they stimulate. Great Leonopteryx are called Toruk, meaning the last shadow, and Thanators are Palulacan, the dry mouth bringer of fear. This is a common tradition in many cultures, with Indo-European cultures referring to brown bears as honey eaters, the one who licks, or even just brown, which is where it's believed the word bear came from. Wolves were also given a similar treatment. It's believed this was either to prevent the animal realising it was being hunted, and thus fleeing or retaliating, or using its true name gave it the power to harm. Considering the immense danger both Thanators and Great Leonoptera exposed to the Na'vi, it's hardly surprising they came to a similar result with their own naming. But the Great Leonopteryx are also worshipped by the Omatakaya clan, who view it as something of a deity, and those with pure souls can even ride one to become Toruk Makto, adopting its title into their own. Again, some cultures adopted the name Bjorn, which meant bear, believing bears as wise enough to not attack their own, and spare those with the same name, or that naming someone after the bear lent them the strength of the great beast. The Thanator was given no such reverence though, and its incredible danger to the Na'vi is only realised in its pure absence, with no song or dance mentioning or celebrating it in Omatakaya culture. With no equivalent to the Toruk Makto, it was simply too dangerous and feared to even bring up in any form of ritual. It's unknown if Neytiri becoming the first Palulakan Makto will have any cultural relevance in later films. With a powerful frame, lethal weapons, considerable speed, and excellent senses, the Thanator is built to live up to its name. As such a large predator, it has its pick of the herbivores in the Pandoran forests, and while slightly able to predate near anything, it presumably has preferences much as many predators do, and the bulk of its diet is likely formed of the large charismatic herbivores also seen in the film itself. Dire horses, sturm beasts, tapirus, and titanothes presumably make up the bulk of its diet, although with varying levels of frequency and importance. As perhaps the most common large herbivore in the forests, dire horses may be the most common prey item, if not the most important. Considerably smaller than a thanator, they may not provide as reliably a good meal as other options, but may be caught more often just due to their great abundance in the forests, as is often the case with very common herbivores that dominate in ecosystem numbers-wise. And dire horses are indeed common, being found in loose herds of over a hundred at times and such huge and variable aggregations aren't uncommon in jungle herbivores. The sociality is known as fission fusion, where animals will live socially but in varying group sizes, that they'll join and leave at different times for different reasons. Rainforest chimps will often slip apart from their hundred strong troops to prevent themselves draining too many resources from an immediate area, and forest elephants will form larger groups in clearings to socialise and reaffirm bonds. Presumably the dire horses will do both, with it being mentioned that they have strong social bonds, and often touch kurus to strengthen them, and also to transfer information. Similarly too, large herds of dire horses may have major ecosystem impacts, as well as their favourite treat of nectar and the bugs inside, they also eat shrubs and tree bark, presumably for the sugar and water it transports. Taking too much bark off a tree can ultimately kill it, or halt its growth, in a process known as ring barking. And whilst the giant trees of Pandora are presumably too large for the dire horses to do this, the undergrowth layer may be kept surprisingly clear, by the actions of the dire horse herds killing smaller, or sapling plants, and generally making it very difficult for new trees to grow. The herds may be one reason why it's rare for trees to reach truly giant sizes, even in the Pandora jungles. To the Na'vi, the dire horses are important forms of transport, but perhaps not so much as the banshees. The bonds aren't as strong, and so long as skilled enough, a dire horse can be ridden by different riders without the same lifelong bond, forming as with the banshees. Another equally important herbivore is the Sturm Beast, a huge and sturdy animal but without an obvious kuru or similar appendage. They're not used as beasts of burden but as meat, and are the most important source of animal protein for the Na'vi. 
As such, they're appropriately worshipped for their own contributions to the Na'vi civilizations. Whilst the adults will protect themselves and their young from smaller predators, with the males being larger than the females and with a more pronounced back ridge, they're also the ideal size range for a Thanator, and likely their preferred prey. If dire horses are akin to the Cheetal deer of Earth, then Sturm beasts are the Sambar deer, and the most preferred prey of the tiger. As predators get larger, they often need larger prey closer to their own body mass, and a tiger's preferred prey weight range is roughly equal to its own weight, or a bit larger. This makes Sambar ideal, and similarly for a Thanator, the Sturm Beast may be its Goldilocks prey item. Dire horses and smaller animals are comparatively unprofitable as meals, as well as being very swift and wary. Titanothers are huge, social, and well armoured all making them a risky bet to take on. But in terms of mass and ease of capture, Sturm Beasts are, as they say, just right. This may be another reason why Thanators are so feared by the Na'vi as well. Both of them share the same favourite protein source, and this leads to competition. In modern times, many don't even think of the local indigenous people as truly being part of ecosystems, when they are, and with the pre-industrialised Na'vi, they're still very much involved with biotic processes, like any other living thing on Pandora. They're still part of the trophic pyramid, and Thanators likely view them as competing species. Whilst predators may occasionally kill each other for an opportunistic meal, directly competing ones will engage in interference competition, which is physically engaging with a competitor to cause harm, or deny resources. This includes killing one another if the circumstances are right. Thanators may well go for any Na'vi hunting parties they come across, to remove competitors for their food, making them a very real threat and thus creating their own fearsome and well-earned reputation. What aren't an ideal prey are the giant hammerhead titanothers. Huge, social, and well-armed, they're more than a match for any predator, being physically reminiscent of buffalo, rhino, or elephant in the rainforest. Whilst Thanators will still give it a shot, the first one seen in the series is hunting titanothers before Jake ruins everything, they're still not regular prey. Thanators only typically hunt in the day when they're very hungry, which may have prompted an attack on such a risky prey, as well as it's a very persistent pursuit of Jake. Large predators can and do singly kill large and dangerous prey. And so a Titanothere isn't completely out of the range of a Thanator, especially infirm individuals or calves, but a frontal confrontation with a healthy bull, or even the whole herd, is likely to end poorly for the predator presumably making Titanothers the least frequent large prey item, even if they have the reward of a mountain of meat. Whilst the whole adult herd will protect themselves, the mature bull is the dominant individual and chief protector of the harem. This is unlike many pachyderm species on Earth, where the bulls typically live apart from the breeding herds, as well as other herbivores too. Having a resident dominant male is probably most similar to equids, and in wild horse species, the males defend their harems fiercely from predators. The bulls display similar ferocity to rivals, and will thrash nearby vegetation to spread their scent. The colourful feathery frill also serves as a warning to both predators and rivals too. Should this fail, the bulls will engage directly with each other, swinging their bony hammerheads at each other's delicate eyes. In Titanothere calves, these aren't solid structures, but rather are more flexible to allow the calves to squeeze through tighter spaces. As they mature, these structures solidify and stiffen, taking on a consistency more similar to that of bone, and becoming bulletproof to even heavy arms fire. Little dietary information is provided on the Titanothers, and again, they may also differ from some other large herbivores, in that they seem to be low browsers or grazers, and so may not have equivalent impacts on rainforest trees. In fact, with their ring barking and huge numbers, dire horses may be the most significant ecosystem engineers compared with their larger neighbours. Titanothers may still contribute with their dung though, and through seed spreading and dumping huge amounts of high quality fertiliser over much of the forest, they can still contribute significantly in their own way. The pig-like tapirus, or Fwampop as its local name, is another forest herbivore, 
and common prey of all, with its small stature and stubby limbs. A successful generalist, perhaps its greatest defence is its friendship with the Na'vi. Much as pigs themselves are to believe to have done, the Tapiras have been partially domesticated from their behaviour of following the Na'vi tribes and living beneath their settlements, like the great home tree, feeding off dropped food and other leftovers, as well as the plants that may grow from discarded seeds, or insects also feeding on refuse. So different clans may even domesticate Tapiras at different rates, depending on their culture and lifestyle, much like pig domestication. Their fleshy tendrils are in fact sensitive whiskers, to help find such morsels in the leaf litter. Their gentle disposition and intelligence allow them to be easily trained, cementing them as the friendly camp followers to the Na'vi tribes. In the skies of Pandora, the clear-cut king is the Great Leonopteryx, or Toruk. Huge, mostly solitary and poorly known, just seeing one is a privilege for anyone, regardless of species, and they're highly revered by the Omatakaya. Unlike the Thanator, the Great Leonopteryx has no real quarrel with the Na'vi themselves, but chiefly subsists off their mounts, the Mountain Banshees, also occasionally descending to the lower forests to eat other prey, like Forest Banshees or the jellyfish-like Medusa. Despite the vast forests covering the planet, it more prefers to hunt like one of the large open country eagles, or a falcon, soaring high over the canopy and picking off other volant animals beneath it, rather than actually utilising the forests themselves much. Indeed, it seems the best way to escape a Toruk that the Na'vi use is to quickly descend into the forest, where its huge size and wingspan impede hunting. Predation from the Toruk may well be the reason for the considerable rookeries of the Banshees, also known as Ikran, in the Hallelujah Mountains. The smaller forest banshee is a more solitary animal, only coming together at large kills like reef sharks or Komodo dragons, or to migrate. This difference in behaviour probably stems from the risk posed by the Toruk. The forest banshees are safe for the most part in the low-risk forests, and are likely only caught should they stray out of them foraging or if they're dispersing. It's said they migrate en masse though, and in some birds it's believed they do this to avoid predation. Likely the case for the forest banshees too. The mountain banshees are permanently out in the open, and are the chief food source of the Toruk, and so form what could be called selfish flocks. The selfish herd is a term made by ethologists, to describe animals living together for their own interests, chiefly for minimising the risk to themselves by having lots of other animals around, who are as likely to be caught, or more so depending on their location in the herd. Considering banshees aren't mentioned to have much in the way of cooperative behaviours, risk dilution and vigilance are probably the reason for the evolution of these social rookeries. A toruk that simply sticks to one rookery would presumably render it extinct over time, and so the huge sizes and rarity of these animals likely stems from the amount of banshee rookeries they need in their territory to support themselves, a mate, and their young. Toruk only breed once every two years, and it's unknown if this is due to long periods of parental investment, courtship, or gestation. But it's just another factor making them a rare and cherished sight on the Pandora skyline. The Banshee themselves descend to the upper canopy to feed on smaller flying animals around the treetops. Omnivorous bioluminescent stink bats are a frequent prey for them, as are the waterbird-like tetrapterons. The Kaluga-like Prolemurus were also at risk, being small social primate-like animals that could be the closest living relative to the Na'vi. They live in matriarchal but polygynous treetop societies, gliding between trees on their patagium to feast on fruits and insects. Not everything was quite so easy to catch though, and foot-long hellfire wasps live up to the namesake with a nasty sting, as well as the protection of the belligerent swarms they lived in. The banshees are also hugely important to the Na'vi, being their chief mounts for inland populations. Unlike dire horses, the banshee would only accept one rider for life, and after the initial bond and flight, the two spend months building their close relationship. And it does seem that this is a mutual bond, with the banshees then choosing to roost in the Omatakaya home tree, instead of the rookery instead after bonding. 
but as well as land and air, Na'vi cultures had also tamed and forged relationships with the creatures of the sea as well. The Metakaina clan had a similar relationship with the Skimwings, known to them as Sorak, and to a lesser extent with the plesiosaur-like Ilu, which had a direhorse-like relationship with the Metakaina. The Skimwings weren't as picky as the Banshees, and would take multiple riders, but only after a considerable bonding period too. Once this relationship is established, in theory anyone can form a bond with either. But how did this bond first originate? In both cases, it does seem to be mutualism. Animal-human cooperation can, in theory, originate from a number of causes that typically benefit at least one of the parties. But for the chief Na'vi cooperations, it does seem it's beneficial to both. In the Elu, the two work cooperatively to drive off potential predators that would be a threat to both of them and Ilu will then make their permanent home ranges around Na'vi villages, and the sheltered atolls they tend to live around, which also presumably confers a benefit to them as well. With the Skimwings, it seems to be a partnership that presumably started and continued with food. Skimwings are obligate carnivores, and the Metakaina clan likely get most of their animal protein from the ocean, so cooperative hunting allows both to get more bang for their buck. The Metakaina are described to use the skim wings to hunt larger prey at the surface, or deeper diving prey, than they'd normally be able to catch alone. With the gharial-like jaws of the skim wings not appearing to be suited to larger prey, both of them benefit with a greater meal than either of them could manage singly if they work together for a successful hunt, and slash or a more successful hunting rate. This is seen in local fishermen in Brazil, where dolphins have better survival and fishermen better catches when the two cooperate closely to catch mullet. Amazingly, and without a kuru, the two simply respond to the foraging cues each other give for success. In some cases, humans and dolphin species collaborate to hunt big game too. The Tua people in southeastern Australia used to work with orca to hunt whales on their seasonal migrations and colonisers later appropriated this practice for their own whaling as well. Much like the Banshees were willing to accept Jake and Quaritch, it seems orcas aren't opposed to working with different people than what they're used to as well. The orca would herd the whales and then alert people with their tail slaps, before assisting in the kill, sometimes even towing the whalers to the quarry and pulling on the landed harpoon. Afterwards, they were allowed to eat the lips and tongue at leisure before the body was harvested. So teamwork resulting in a better reward for all is fair reason on how such cooperation may stem. The Banshees are presumably similar, and artwork shows them being used in hunts of large prey like sturm beasts. The Banshees presumably aren't opposed to carrion, and are well fed for their use in such hunts that may help form the initial bond. Roosting in the giant tree of the Omatakaya may also be a considerably safer place from Toruk attack as well, and so cooperation may be a double benefit to the Banshees too. The Metakaina also have an intimate and ancient relationship with the Tulkan, the giant whale-like creatures of the Pandoran Oceans. Tulkan are as sentient as any human or Na'vi, with their own rich language, culture and history some of which they partially share with the Metakaina. The two share an annual ceremony of introducing the new members of each other's social unit to one another, and the young Tolkien are adorned with tattoos. The Tolkien are described as verbose and thoughtful. They can communicate flawlessly with the Na'vi, and possess their own songs and poetry. And with how our own whales evolved, there is basis for this. Sperm whales communicate in cliques known as coders, clicks that vary in number and timing between them used in social situations that are also believed to have dialects to them, depending on the pod or region. A new paper in preprint suggests that it may be even more complex, with sperm whales having their own equivalents to vowels and diphthongs, a sound made by combining two vowels together in a syllable like coin. If true, this would make sperm whale communication vastly more complex, and capable of communicating far more information than was initially believed. It's hard to test whether whales sing for fun, and even with this new information, what they're actually saying. 
But it's also not so hard to imagine an animal like the Tolkien having a language that supports songs and poems in comparison. Cetaceans will associate with each other to an extent, with whales feeding communally or dolphins associating with whales. The reasons for this are still unknown, with suggestions including that they may help each other with foraging, or that smaller dolphins may ride in the bow wave of whales to save energy. This could be how this initial friendship started, with the first contact being at shared feeding spots, or travelling Na'vi on their skim wings or illus, swimming with Tolkien to save energy, but ultimately breaking the ice, as it were. But unlike the other relationships the Na'vi can often have, it could be that there's no real direct benefit to this association, as with the sentience of the Tolkien, it may be that there isn't a major benefit, it's simply a peaceful social meeting of different civilizations. This may also partly stem from a desire for protection too. Humpback whales are known for an unusual behaviour where they show extreme belligerence to mammal-eating orcas, especially when they're hunting, often driving them away and sometimes even saving the prey item. There are multiple suggestions for the reason of this preventative aggression, including increasing their own fitness. Mammal-eating orcas will predate humpback calves, and the whales driving them away regardless of circumstance is often in their interests. But it's also suggested cautiously there may be some interspecies altruism here, poorly understood as it is. So this may be the case especially with the more intelligent and sentient Tolkien too. In one scene, the Tolkien Payakan kills an Akula, essentially a Pandoran shark to save one of Jake's kids. Whilst Payakan does kill it, which is against Tolkien culture, it's quite possible Tolkien naturally behave this way, albeit without killing, solely as the Akula nature goes against their own pacifist beliefs. Tolkien have been blighted by incredible intraspecific hostility, and so have sworn off their past of violence even to the point of neglecting self-defence. Their pacifist nature and unwillingness to see harm done to others could have been one of the first seeds of their relationship with the Na'vi, especially if they had a similar situation to Payakan saving someone. And lost Na'vi at sea will likely need saving. The top predators of the Pandoran coast are Nalutza and Akula, huge shark-like animals that typically hunt via ambush. Unlike the Tolkien or Elu, they breathe underwater, and so can pursue their aquatic prey anywhere. And at the sizes they grow to, anything short of a Tolkien itself is on the menu. Both are determined and surprisingly cunning hunters. Nalutza will leap free of the water pursuing their prey, and the Akula hunting Loak seem to have some understanding that they'd have to return to the surface for air, and waited to attack then, only to be killed by Piyakan. It's no surprise the Na'vi have a hostile relationship with Akula, and to kill or repel one from the village reefs is considered the ultimate challenge any Na'vi can face in the coastal cultures. Plentiful other animals make up the rich prey base for the hunters of the seas, all carrying their own ways at escaping predation too. Glider fins are the sardines or herring of the Pandoran seas present in huge numbers and being a vitally important food source for the higher trophic levels. The hornfish uses its iconic eye stalks to detect movement in the water column that may warn it of impending danger. Flat skates use good old-fashioned speed, especially useful as they're relished as cuisine by the metakaina, unlike the feather tail, who are generally viewed as completely unpalatable. Despite this, feather tails are still popular prey for many other oceanic hunters, and may provide some niche partitioning between them and the metakaina. Pincerfish, known as slopec, are smaller mesopredators that use their own considerable tusks to hunt smaller prey among the reefs. Harmless and occasionally eaten by larger creatures, the tusks aren't used for defence against predators, but rather other pincerfish in territorial disputes. Overall, the species seen here are just a scarce handful of the diverse worlds of Pandora. And if the films follow the trend of the way of water, then other films may continue to explore other biomes and the creatures within them. Thanks for watching. 
And thanks to my patrons Phenomenon, The Supra Stupa, Sam Burgo, Sonam Lobsong, K Sandum, Big Al, Erengar Steiny, Flygon's Archives, Hui Hui, Original Username, Tristan Berry, Evely, Howleth, Archazor Queen, Seth Fake Last Name, Zaysa, Dodecablos, and Bazugazu Bachohatsu Bachomatsu for their ongoing kindness keeping things going. A link is provided in the description for any who would like to sign up, and any amount is always appreciated. If not, liking the video helps. And if you enjoyed this video, why not subscribe and check out the rest of the content too. More fictional worlds and universes have also been covered in a similar style, like Peter Jackson's Skull Island. Quite a few asked for Avatar over the years, and it did seem like a ripe fruit for picking. With some supplementary books on the table, it did seem like it could be given the Kong treatment. But with that said, I always thought the situation was quite different. With Kong, the book was lesser known, more detailed, and out of print for a far older film. Whereas with Avatar, the books were still in print, readily available, and there had already been quite considerable and widely viewed YouTube coverage of Pandora that all made me somewhat reticent to cover it until I had a better angle. The papers of Killer Whale, Dolphin, and other human-animal cooperation prompted me at last after the release of Way of Water, and so hopefully this video delivers to those that were keen for it. That said, the internet does seem weirdly hateful of Avatar to an extent, so who knows how well this video will do. Also, one of the books used for this is only apparently semi-canonical, but the information in it seemed worthwhile to use where relevant. So there's that to note as well, in case anyone is a strict Avatar lore enthusiast. Next time will be another Spec Evo short, and with it we'll be rounding out 2023 on the Unnatural History channel. As ever, I hope I'll see you there for it, and as it'll be after the day itself, may all my viewers and subscribers who celebrate it have a Merry Christmas.